Well, a very warm welcome to you this morning on this Lord's Day. Uh, I welcome you to, uh, joining us uh, on this, this video stream. And it's my prayer that you be blessed with uh, God's Word in these uh, difficult, uh, trying times. Um, and that we can be united together, even while at home, around God's Word. So we're going to begin our service with that. I'm going to read from the, uh, the letter of 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. And uh, I'm reading verses 11 to uh, 24. And this will tie in with, with the sermon later on, but it's a really encouraging message to us. This is 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 to 24. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was uh, of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be dis uh, surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deeds and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what he pleases, do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Amen. Well, I hope that as we look into similar themes and a different uh, thing that John has written, uh, in God's word, that we would be really blessed and encouraged with the love of God and that we would have more love for one another. I'm going to now um, pray for, for, our, for us, for our church, for various different needs, um, and then we will have the reading for the sermon after that. So I'm going to now pray. Please join me uh, in prayer and, um, and give a hearty amen from home. Uh, the, the amen is the, is the agreement, the, the yes, that I, I want this to be so as well. So I pray that as you are at home, you will be praying amen along with my prayers. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you have made known to us what love is. Lord, your word says that you are love. You are the embodiment of love. Love cannot be known apart from you. And we thank you that because of your great love, you have saved us. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, so that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Lord, the eternal life that you have granted us is not an eternal life of, of boredom or emptiness, uh, Lord, in eternal life on this world, we have to get boring after a certain amount of time, Lord, but you've given us eternal life where we may experience your love to its fullest extent forever. There won't be a millisecond of eternity that is not being filled with an incomprehensible vastness of your love. We thank you that you've filled our hearts with your love through the cross of Christ. And I pray that Lord we'd have more love for, for one another as, as we see and soak in the love that you have for us. And so Lord in that vein we pray in love 
for, for those of our congregation who are especially uh, in need at this time. We pray for the, the Butler family and for, for little Polly, who's, um, who's a bit unwell at the moment. We pray for Colin and Darren, Lord, who must be experiencing real uh, anxiety and worry. We pray for them and for the children that you give them peace, um, that they would be trusting and relying upon you, whatever may happen, Lord. So we pray for her, that she be healed, Lord, uh, but that whatever goes on, whatever happens in the next few days, uh, that you be glorified, that you be trusted, and that you would be loved, Lord, for in all things you work for us in love. Lord, we pray as well for, for Tammy um, and for Willow. I was encouraged the other day just to speak to Tammy the other day on the phone, uh, to hear how well Paul, uh, Willow's getting on, playing the piano, Lord. Um, we pray for, for that little girl, that you would continue to, to, to strengthen her and grow her up, Lord, um, despite all of her different needs. We pray for Caelan and for Dylan as well. Uh, we pray for all the, the youngsters of our church, that you give them peace um, and rest, uh, and they won't be losing their minds at home. Uh, at this time, we pray for others as well, for, for, for John Buckle, for, for John Page, um, Esther Quinton, Lord, having a, a blood test uh, this past week as well. We pray for the Mosses at home and uh, Peter Matthias up at the care home. Um, Lord, we just pray for, 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 for as well for, for, the, um, for the families of, of those who are lost at, at Pilgrim Homes and um, other care homes as well. We think of Margaret Fisher's family. We pray for her grandchildren, especially Josh, um, who was in the accident uh, last year. We pray for them, Lord. We know how fervently Margaret prays for them. Uh, we pray, Lord, that those prayers would pay off. We know those prayers glorify you, Lord, whatever happens. But I pray that those prayers would be answered in the affirmative uh, and that those, those people would be saved and be brought into your kingdom um, where they may also uh, see Margaret, Lord. We pray for, for those who have been furloughed at this time. Uh, we think of, of people like Ben, Lord, and others. Uh, we pray that you'd be with them uh, at this time and that, um, that very soon they'll be able to, to get back to work uh, as well. We pray for those who are at work and the stress that that involves. We pray for those who are working for the NHS and uh, emergency services and work is just uh, over the top at the moment. We pray uh, for them that you would um, rest their, their weary bones and their weary hearts and souls and give them more strength for the coming week. We pray, Lord, for the youth groups in our church. Uh, we pray for all the young people that we have been desperately missing over these past couple of months. But, Lord, we know that uh, this coming week we have a Bible class as well and, uh, and uh, senior FOI that will be hosted over Zoom. We pray, Lord, that uh, many of the young children that, um, that usually come would come to those as well. It would be great to see them over the camera and to see how they're getting on, uh, what they've been doing over lockdown, Lord. And we pray that they would be encouraged by, by your word as well as we seek to minister to them in, in whatever way we can. Lord, we thank you for the gift of, of um, technology that has allowed us to, to do these things. Lord, we pray uh, elsewhere as well. We pray for Finland. Uh, it was really encouraging to watch the video for Heart Cry, uh, the Missionary Society. Uh, on the work there over in Finland, we don't often hear about uh, parts of Europe, we often hear about uh, places in Africa, in the Middle East, in South America, but we don't often hear of other countries that are in many ways quite similar to ours. And we uh, pray for Finland, Lord, um, uh, that is just full of uh, empty uh, religion. We pray for the Lutheran priests there, Lord, many of whom will not be converted. Uh, we pray uh, for them, Lord, that they would come to a true understanding of your gospel and that those who are preaching the true gospel, the one and only gospel, would be filled with your blessings and encouragement to, uh, to carry on doing that, Lord, in your strength and that you build your church uh, there in Finland. And Lord, we do pray as well for the lockdown that it would end. Very soon we are encouraged to hear that um, it could be as early as the 4th of July. I was having uh, premonitions of September or October Lord, when churches could reopen. So it was encouraging to hear that churches could potentially reopen uh, on the 4th of July. And we pray that that would be the case and that it would not be extended uh, further on in the year, Lord. For we long to meet back together again in person and have fellowship with the brothers and sisters, Lord. So we pray that it happen sooner rather than later. And we pray that you'll be working all of your purposes 
through this lockdown, through this virus. We know that you're in control, that we should not be complaining in any situation or circumstance. We should be giving thanks and trusting in you at all times, Lord. So please help us to do that now and help us as we now look into your word to abide in your love. We pray that your word would abide in us as we read it. So please bless us now for your name's sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to read now from the scriptures, so please grab a Bible uh, if you have one with you. So I'm going to read from the book of John, chapter 15. We are carrying on in our series uh, in the I Ams. This technically is the last I Am. Um, traditionally anyway, uh, but I'm going to be a bit sneaky and, and preach another one because there is, a, there is another I am sort of uh, hiding a couple of chapters after this and so maybe ne next week we will um, uh, preach fr from that verse and conclude the series but this is the second to last I am then. So it's John chapter 15 and I'm going to be reading from uh, verse 1 down to verse 17. So John 15, 1 to 17. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in, me, in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruits, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do whatever I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruits, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Amen. Well, may God's word be blessed to us. Okay, so I am the true the vine. John 15. Well, vines aren't all that commonplace here in England, probably for good reason. Uh, we have a vine outside of, of our house. Um, it's never really been particularly exciting. <laughs> uh, we've been living there for about 20 years now, and we've only ever, ever got, I think, one bottle of wine out from it, and it wasn't the sort of bottle that you would sell for a high price. Um, it doesn't really bear much fruit, and when it does, it's not particularly nice, it's quite sour. So uh, it's not a very su su successful vine, really, um, our vine in this country. Uh, but if you go to um, Europe, you go to France, to Germany, Italy, uh, you will see vines everywhere. You will see whole hillsides filled with, with vines because they are successful, because they do bear good, good fruit. Well, Israel was an agrarian culture and vines were an essential part of, of, of their farming community and were exceptionally commonplace. 
So, so much so that the, the nation's actual symbol uh, eventually became a vine. Uh, I think that in a couple of years uh, prior to when Jesus was alive, um, some of the coins for Israel were marked with a vine. It was symbolic of their country. Even in the Bible, there are many, many parts of the Bible that describes Israel as a vine. Interestingly enough, every single time the Bible talks about Israel as a vine, it's always in reference to how it's failed to bear fruit. It kind of describes uh, Israel in a similar way to, to the vine in my back garden. Not a very successful vine. A vine that failed to bring an abundance of fruit. But here in this passage we see a true vine, a, a good vine that bears wonderful and good fruit. And that is, is Jesus' aim for us in this passage, that as we abide in him and draw from him all that, that he is, he will bear much fruit that glorifies God. So firstly, context uh, we're essentially in the same dialogue as the last sermon on the way of truth and the life. Um, it, it's his farewell message, as it were. He is uh, hours away from the trial and then from the cross uh, in the next day. Uh, he's probably making this speech as they're heading uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane, coming away from the, um, from the Last Supper meal. And Jesus is teaching his disciples, who are probably very scared and are wondering, well, how is Jesus going to help us after he's gone? Uh, what good are we going to do? How are we not going to fail? And Jesus is kind of answering that thought. So we come to Jesus' seventh I am statement now. And the seven is number of completion. Uh, remember as well that, that I am is a call back to Jesus' deity. Uh, I am is what the name Yahweh means, God's name. And so we come to the first point I want to make. Uh, and that is I am is our true covenant community. I am is our true covenant community. Look at uh, chapter 15 and verse 1 is the first part. I am the true vine. Now I believe that what Jesus is doing here is alluding to Jeremiah 2 21 especially with verse 3 here in mind where it says that you are clean. Uh, this is Jeremiah 2 21. This is uh, God speaking to Israel. Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the strain, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord. How can you say, I am not unclean? So there you have a vine and cleanliness here in John 15. Now, as I was saying earlier, Israel was a failed vine. They, they failed to produce fruits. God had given them the land, the promised land. He had taken them out of Egypt and planted them there. He had given them the, the law, but they had failed to keep it. They had tarnished and dirty the land. They had turned to worshipping idols and committing every sin that you can imagine within the, the walls of holy Jerusalem. And so God eventually uprooted them with Babylon and, and Assyria. And that Israel, that covenant community, stood as a picture and a symbol and a shadow for us to see that, that we're in need of something better than that, better than that old covenant Israel. We need a better covenant community, a, a community that delights in God's law and bears much fruit. Israel was unable to keep the law. And as we know from Jesus, the, the roots of the law are love. That is Jesus' summary, as it were, of the whole law. Love for God and love for, for neighbour. But Jeremiah goes on to say that, well, they couldn't do that because they needed a new heart. A, a new heart where the kind of very root of their being has God's law written on it. A new heart that loves God's law. We have to ask ourselves, why is it that a utopia doesn't exist? You know, you can give a country all the best laws in the world, like Israel, and what happens to them? It turns to chaos. 
Our country has had very many good laws in the past. What is it now? Chaos. It's not good laws that we need. It's a new heart that we need. And that is what is happening here. This comes to fruition because Jesus is saying that he is the true vine. He is the true covenant community of God. That, that shadow and type that Israel served in the Old Testament, Jesus fulfills that. He is the archetypal good Israelite. There are many psalms that we can look at that, that where, where the, um, the psalmist is this good and faithful Israelite who's singing about how he loves God's law and he keeps it. Jesus is the one who perfectly fulfills that. He is the archetypal good Israelite and is the embodiment of what Israel should have been. So Jesus, as the true Israel, of God, the true covenant community of God, we must be in him and in his new covenant to bear good fruit. This vine is not a failed vine, but it is the perfect and true vine. And that is why the author of Hebrews, uh, he writes to the Jewish Christians who are considering kind of going back to the old covenant ways. He says, no, don't go back to that. That was a failed vine. That that was never the intention and ultimate aim anyway. Christ is the fullness of things. So stay in him. Look at verse 4 of chapter 15. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Let's, sort of, let's, let's just talk about that word abide for a moment. If you have an NIV, it may say remain. What does it mean to abide in Christ? Abiding is to be receiving, trusting, believing, savouring, resting in, treasuring all that God is in Christ for us. I'll, I'll repeat that for you. Abiding is to be receiving Trusting, believing, savouring, resting in, treasuring all that God is in Christ for us. And to allow it to, to flow into our lives. We could say that it is deeply and personally knowing God through Christ Jesus. John 17, 3, hint, hint. Believing is an attachment to, a coming to Jesus, a receiving from Jesus. It's trusting in Jesus, remaining in fellowship with him and connecting to him so that all that, God is for, all that God is for us in him is flowing like, 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 like a, a life-giving sap into our lives. Think about the sap in a vine. It, it brings all the water and um, the minerals from the soil up through the vine and into the branches to then bear fruit. It's all the life-giving goodness, isn't it? For those who are abiding in Christ, all of who Jesus is and what he has done, it's like that sap, it's like the lifeblood. And it's all coursing through our veins and we are receiving his strength and power and the newness of life that is in him. He is the vine and it goes into us who are the branches. That's what it means to Abide, and you might remember our studies in Colossians. We looked about how Christ was, we are rooted in Christ and we're drawing up thankfulness from Him. It's some of the imagery to that. Well, this is an Israel here that will bear much fruit. This is what changes us. For, for we, the church, are the new covenant community of God. We are the true Israel. And it, it changes us into a, a right covenant community that obeys God from the heart. Why? Because we are becoming like Jesus because we are intricately connected to him. We are the branches. He is the vine. He's given us a new heart and it's his heart and he is in us and, and we are in him. If the vine is bad, then the fruit will be bad. The branches will be unhealthy. Uh, if the soil is, is you know, empty, then nothing's going to come of it. But what have we learned about this true vine over the past few months? That he is the bread of life that satisfies, 
the light of life that reveals and testifies of who God is to us. He is the resurrection that defeats death. He is the good shepherd that guides and protects. All that he is, is poured into us by abiding in him. And what is the fruit that he brings us? The fruitful, flourishing Christian life. A life of prayerful dependence upon God, driven by faith that brings love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, the fruits of the Spirit. A life that reflects Christ's image. And that's our purpose, isn't it? We're created in God's image and we were created to reflect that in how we live, but then we tarnished that. But now we are being recreated in Christ's image. Unless we abide in the vine, nothing of any eternal value will be produced in our lives. Israel was a picture of humanity without the life of the light of life, the true vine, the bread of life. And again and again and again, they proved to be unfaithful. But the true Israel, the true vine, Jesus Christ, will not fail. We are guaranteed the church will prevail where Israel failed. And for millions of years, millions and millions and millions of years into eternity, songs will be sung of of our works that remain For they are of eternal worth because they are glorifying God in truth, in spirit and in truth. So uh, look at verse, uh, the end of verse 1, the end of verse 2. My father is the vine dresser. For every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may be more fruitful. And so we uh, just imagine the Trinitarian imagery here. So you have the father who is the vine dresser, the son is the vine. And you could probably see the spirit as the sap that the sort of uh, what's, you know, uh, enacting the vine into us, the branches. Now, this verse is talking about discipline in the Christian life for a branch to bear more fruit. The gardener's got to come with his second tears and and cut off the dead parts. And that involves to cut. That can be painful. And often in our life, and maybe people at home nodding and agreeing with me, God removes things from us. He cuts things away from us. He yanks it out of our hands to be so tightly clinging to it. But it's for our good. He's disciplining us because he loves us. And the scriptures say that, that a father disciplines his son whom he loves. Verse 3, look at verse 3 for a second. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. So earlier on I read in Pastor Jeremiah, Israel was an unclean vine. That tried to wash itself again and again to to no avail. But Jesus' disciples, they are already clean. Why? Because of his word abiding in them. Through Christ's word they have come alive and have been cleansed. It wasn't by human effort or willpower or some decision that they made. But it was his word that powerfully affected within them. It was his law being written on their hearts. Look at verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. These are some really humbling words. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. And I really hope we take this in because we live in such a proud culture. Look what I did. Look at my achievements. Look at my own little empire that I have constructed. Essentially what Jesus is saying here is that unless you are connected to him, unless the spirit abides in you, absolutely nothing of any eternal worth will be coming from your life. I don't care if you're a a multi-million pound corporation owner or if you're a chemical scientist. Unless you abide in the vine... Nothing that you do in this life will bear one tuppence for eternity. None of it. You achieved nothing. Zilch, zero, nada, nothing. 
And anything that you did perhaps achieve, you only achieved because God gave you the ability and strength and life to even do it. He gave you your very hand. He gave you breath in your lungs. Yeah. I don't know if ever, perhaps when you were, when you were younger, you um, got to sit on your dad's lap while in the car and hold the steering wheel and say, look, I'm driving. You know, you're like, yeah, look at me, I'm driving. But <laughs> we weren't driving, were we? We had no cause or reason to boast. And, and likewise, it is only in Christ that we can boast. We're like lights or uh, electrical equipment in a house. And unless we are connected to the mains power supply, we're useless. A branch without the vine cannot bear fruit. A, a, a light without being connected to the electrics will not do anything. It is the vine, it is the electricity that brings the power. How humbling is that? To think that every single good and worthy thing that you've ever done in your Christian life, in, in, in things that I've done in my Christian life, that was Jesus working within us. And we would not have done it apart from him. That's so humbling and it crushes any cause for pride, doesn't it? It also tells us that Jesus is sufficient for our every need and purpose and good work. You know, we go to new age psychobabble or yoga or something to try and sort out our sin problems, but Christ is sufficient for these things. The thing that's just like spraying a you know, deodorant over a bad smell, it's still there. But Christ uproots these bad things through giving us a new heart. These are such important things. Look at verse 6. I, I, I could you know, spend a lot more time on these things, but we're trying to get through this whole passage because it's quite meaty. Look at verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branch that gathers, thrown into the fire and burned. Now Jesus is probably referring to a passage in Ezekiel 15 where uh, God describes how the wood of a vine is essentially pointless for, for any good thing. You know, the wood from... Um, another tree could be used for a, a tool, couldn't it? Or building for a house. But you don't use the wood from a vine for anything, really. Um, it's just there to bear fruit. If it comes up, it's useless. All you can use it for is for burning. And the point here is, is that within the visible covenant community, within the church, there are branches that do not bear fruit and will be cut off and burnt. There are people in the visible covenant community, the visible church, who do not bear fruit. They're not outflowing of Christ's character. Why? Because they didn't abide in the vine. They didn't rest, they didn't believe, they didn't know the vine. And so they're broken off and cast out. And, and this is how it is in the church. There are people who are visibly a, a part of the church community, they get baptised, they become a church member maybe, um, they have you know, the bread and the wine at the Lord's table, they f fellowship with the saints, but it later transpires that they were fake branches. They leave the church, they apostatise, they give up the faith, they wander off into heinous sin, um, they join a cult maybe, and God breaks them off. He removes them from the community because it was evident that they were never part of the community. Their fruit did not abide. And it's not as if they had borne good fruit and then they failed and wilted. It's not like, ah, but my, my good works are what sustain me on the vine. No, but John goes into this in his first letter where he says, They went out from us because they were not of us. And what better example than Judas he had walked with Jesus for three years. He had preached in Jesus' name. He had done miracles even and then betrays him. He was not abiding in the vine. And the book of, the, the book of Hebrews uh, offers really stark warnings for these people who have visibly been a part of spiritual things. They've been a part of the covenant community of church and then they apostatize and leave and it says that the judgment for them will be even worse than the first if they hadn't have been a part of the church and maybe for you today who's watching maybe that's you maybe many years ago in the past you were involved in a church 
you were visibly a part of that community, but you left. You didn't abide in the vine. The encouragement for you today is to repent, to turn back. For the warning is, you'll be swept up and thrown into the fire. We have to remember that God is a good shepherd who, who cares for his sheep and is loving and kind and merciful. But he is also a consuming fire who will burn and destroy and judge sinners who have not repented. And so I encourage you to repent, to abide in Christ and to trust in the Son. Look at verse 7. That judgment is not so for those who are in the vine. Look at verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Well, how about that for a promise? Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. It's not a problem with that. You and I have prayed for a lot of things and they haven't been answered in the affirmative, have they? So what's going on? Notice how he says, if. There's a condition, if. If my word abides in you, if my word takes root in you, as it were, if it finds a home in your mind, if it grows and establishes itself inside of your life, what will happen? It renews your mind, doesn't it? It renews our mind, it changes our nature, it changes our will and our desires, it changes the things that we want to pray for. Do you see, we don't twist God's arm, but rather through his word, he changes our mind. He changes our desire to the things that he desires so that we pray for the things that are his will and God's will will happen. That is the promise for us here uh, to kind of carry on with the fruit illustration. Uh, think of it as us saying, uh, Lord, give me oranges. Uh, I pray that I would bear many oranges because I really just desire oranges and I think that that's kind of your will that I would do that. So Lord, I pray that I would bear oranges. But then as his word comes into us, as the sap of his word seeps into the branches, into our veins, his word says, but you aren't going to grow oranges. You're a vine. My desire is for you to bear fruit, bear grapes. And as that life-giving word and force comes inside of us and changes our way of thinking, we start to pray, well, yeah, Lord, I pray that I produce grapes and not oranges. So our will conforms to his by his word, and we start to pray his thoughts after him, as it were. You see that? Those are prayers that God will answer, because we are praying according to his will that is found in his word. We pray, not my will, but yours be done. And it's staggering to think that Jesus would pray that prayer in a matter of hours. Um, look at verse, uh, verse 8 now. Verse 7 ties to verse 8 as well as to verse 5. Look at verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Let me just share an illustration with you from, from John Piper. Suppose you are totally paralysed. And you can do nothing for yourself but talk. And suppose a strong and reliable friend promised to live with you and do whatever you needed done. How would you glorify that friend if a stranger came to see you? Would you glorify his generosity and strength by trying to get out of bed and carry him and show how strong you are? No, you would say, friends, come and lift me up, be with me, strengthen me, help me. Put, put a pillow behind my head and put my glasses on so that I can see our guest. And so your visitor would learn from your requests that you are helpless, that, that you can do nothing for yourself and that your friend is strong and kind you glorify your strong, kind friend by needing him and by asking him for help and counting on him. That's us, remember, isn't it? We're the ones who can do nothing, who are, who are needy. But still, God intends to be glorified through us bearing fruit. So 
How do we glorify him? Well, Jesus gives the answer in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. We pray. We ask God to do for us through Christ what we can't do for ourselves, namely bear fruit. That flourishing Christian life that we just can't do on our own. We pray for that. And John 15 verse 8 gives the result. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. This is how God is glorified and shown for his strength and power. Prayer is the open admission that without Christ we can do nothing. It's, it's the turning away of self-confidence and it's abiding in the grace and love that flows out of Christ and promises to bear much fruit in us. And we unrelentingly depend and rely upon him and we ask him, help me bear fruits, help me love others. For apart from you, I can do nothing. And that glorifies him. So second and final point now. I am, so first one was I am is our true covenant community. Second and final point, I am is love. Look at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And that verse is simply staggering. And I almost want to sort of stand here just for a minute let you just think about it. <laughs> the, the eternal and perfect, complete love of the Father for the Son that was given for all of eternity and given perfectly flows from the Son to us. It's unfathomable almost to think about that, that the perfect love of God for his son flows into us. And what can I say? Um, verse 10, look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Look at this for a second at verse 24 of chapter 14, the last chapter, verse 24. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. So as we are filled with the love of the Father through the Son and we love God and we abide in him, we continue to abide and we bear testimony of that abiding and of that love as we obey his commandments. And, and we see from verse 12 what is his commandment. That we love one another. And so we do that, as we do that, sorry, as we love one another, we obey his commandments, we experience more of God's love. That's how I read verse, verse 10 and verse 9. And it's as if the sap of God's love, as, it, as we obey the commandments and bear fruit, then more sap comes and more and more and more. There's more blessing and more love. And so as we obey his commandments and love one another, we ourselves experience and enjoy more of God's love. Look at this, this is 1 John 3, 24, we read it earlier on at the start. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So keeping Jesus' commandments within that prayerful dependence is evidence and testimony of our salvation and it increases our strength and experience of his love. It establishes us, it grows our roots deep into him. It gives us a greater enjoyment of God's love as we see God's love being worked out from our own hands towards people around us. And as we show love to others, that should be telling us, well, that's a picture of how God's loved me. And I wouldn't be doing this apart from his love. How marvellous is his love. And of course, you know, we're never going to do that perfectly, are we? If, if we were to love one another as perfectly as Jesus, well, you know. Um, but all of us, it's a sentence in that all of us should be looking at our lives and saying, no, I'm not what I should be. But hallelujah, I'm not what I was. Love is now the defining factor of who I am. 
You know, love is the greatest essence of our religion. There's a verse that says these three remain, faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love should be the first description of the Christian above all else in many ways. And could that be a description of you? Would people say, yeah, he's a loving person? Would you say that of me? Would I say that of you? I don't know. But love should be the defining character of us as Christians. But also, God commanding us to go and love others is a way of him loving us. Look at verse 11. These things that I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So as we love others and more love is being poured into us, also with that is joy. That we are sharing all things with Christ and now his joy flows through that sap into the branches into us. Why is it we lack so much joy sometimes? Maybe it's because we aren't loving each other enough. <laughs> and I have to remember this command is not burdensome. It's not a heavy weight that's thrown us like a harsh taskmaster. But God gives us these commands for our own joy. I mean, how wonderful is it that, that God doesn't just leave us in our state? He just saves us and just says, right, I'll leave you to it. No, he gives us commandments for us to, to, to work in and to, the wonderful things for us to go and do. If Psalm 19 says that God's law is sweet like honey. Uh, earlier on, I was, um, today I was eating some grapes and, you know, grapes come from a vine and, and they taste good. They're pleasurable and nice and delicious and so should our works be. They should be tasty as it were. It's for our joy. Uh, imagine that you were a, um, a blind, uh, lame, dumb, deaf, paralysed person um, and a doctor came and, and he cured you, he gave you sight, he, 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 he fixed your voice and he doesn't just leave you but he, he teaches you to see, to walk, he teaches you to, to sing, he commands you to sing and then through us singing and seeing and walking we are like wow this is amazing it shows us how we have been healed and it shows us how amazing our healer was and it shows people around us how powerful he is. Uh, and likewise, so it is with us obeying God's commands to love one another. It shows us the evidence that we have been brought into life. It shows people around us how effective God's word and power is that he's in the business of changing lives. And it brings him glory as it brings us joy in enjoying these things that he has given us. And then finally becomes the very source and root and the soil, as it were, of this love. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. How has he loved us? Verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. No greater love, no deeper love, there's nothing higher, nothing weightier, highest and the truest, purest form of love is Christ and Him crucified. Remember a few weeks ago I taught you that word um, agape, the Greek word for the highest form of love, sacrificial love. You know, our, our world has just so many ideas of what love is. The world has gone crazy, hasn't it, lately, in trying to define and embody love. Uh, behind the, um, the, the slogan, behind the same-sex marriage movement, was love wins. <laughs> and yet, this is the same society that legalises the mass murder of children in the womb. A society of endless self-love that isn't even love at all. This world doesn't give a rip about what love is and has no idea of how to define what love is. All this world knows is hate. But the definition of love from God is sacrifice. That is the essence of what true love is. Sacrifice. 
you know, love was, as I said earlier, was a fulfillment of the law. That the law, in its basis, was about love. The Ten Commandments, love, everything was about love. Israel couldn't do that. But the true vine, he does. He fulfills the law in its totality, to its greatest extent. That's what the cross is. That is the law being completed perfectly. Completely. Self-sacrificing love. Agape love embodies is Christ crucified, laying down his life. For his friends, and he calls us friends who abide in him. In this is love, not that we have loved God. It's almost laughable to think about our love for him. In this is love, he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. That's the wrath absorbing sacrifice for our sins. Sacrifice. One of the biggest questions in the world today is, what is love? Show me, embody love to me, show me, just tell me what love is. And the answer from the Bible is, look at the cross. Look at him there, hanging on a tree, crucified, naked, bloodied, gruesome. A dying man in your place. Every other I am that we have looked at in this series, it has um, the word life in it somewhere, doesn't it? There was the light of life, the bread of life. You know, they all had life somewhere in them, in, intermingled. What about this one? Where is life in the true vine? Is it you know, the true vine of life? No, that's not there. Verse 13. He lays down his life for his friends. The bread of life broken. The light of life dis- diminished. The good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus gives his life so that we may have eternal life. Christ crucified is the root of love. And in line of application for us. Jesus points us to this, that that the kind of love that is shown for us at the cross, that sacrificial love of the Father through the Son, enacted by the Spirit, that is the sort of love that we are to give to others. That is the fruit that we are to bear. This is 1 John 3.16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, we just kind of looked at them in John 15. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. To sort of love that could look your brother or sister in Christ in the eye and say, I am willing to die for you. I'm willing to put to death my own desires and self interests for your sake daily. You know, there's, there's verses in the Bible that are, it's kind of like being hit in the face with a baseball bat. Other verses, it's like a wrecking ball. And I think this is one of them. But I have to remind myself, his commands are not burdensome, but are for my joy. And so there's a real challenge here. You look at verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, that is not what makes us his friends. But it's what characterises his friends. And so we have to receive that challenge. Are we characterised by obedience to Jesus? Are we characterised by love? Love for, for one another? Because this is what we're appointed for. Look at verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. That you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide to the word you ask far in my name he may give to you. From Ephesians 2 it says that we were created, we were predestined to bear fruit. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. It isn't as if God just saves us and just says, that's it, cheers, see you soon. No, we are saved for 
good works, to glorify God, to abide in the vine. If so, if you aren't bearing fruit, if there's no fruit or there's little fruit and there's no change, what's going on? We have to accept this challenge. Maybe it's God pruning us. Maybe it's, maybe it's God saying that, that we're fake branches and that we need to repent and be saved. We're exhorted, aren't we, to examine ourselves. And it's unhealthy to do that 24-7. But we are called to examine ourselves and make our calling and election sure. Have we forgotten who we are, baby? Jesus said in verse 3, you know, you are clean. Have we forgotten that? The Apostle Paul says that you are unleavened. Now go and leaven yourself. No, go and live out who you actually are. We must be repentant people, contrite over our sin and in close relationship, abiding with Christ and allowing what we already are in Christ to be flowing into our lives and out through our hands as we love one another, not just in word and thought, but in deeds, in deeds. We're often too stingy for people, aren't we? Especially British people. (laughs) Do you hunger for that good fruit? Do you remember the highways of the hearts illustration from, um, from last week from Psalm 84? It is our hearts, is the destination and road, the road map of our heart. Is it focused towards Zion and towards Christ? Is Jesus the greatest desire of our, of our hearts? And maybe you're saying, you know, I, I want that. But it just isn't there. Help me. You know, I, I want more of Christ. I want to bear fruit, but I'm just starved. I'm weak. I need help. Let God's word abide in you and you will bear much fruit. Just surround yourself with God's words. You know, that's what I found happened to me maybe two, three years ago. And I don't know where I was in many ways three years ago. And then suddenly just kind of just letting myself into more of God's word, surrounding myself, going to as many Bible studies I could find, you know, and uh, reading more and, and listening to sermons, and just surrounding myself with God's word and letting it take root in my heart. It, it, it affects you. God's word does not go out void and it changes people. And so I implore you, let his words fill you and cry out in prayer. Lord, increase my faith. Help my unbelief. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But maybe, maybe you aren't actually in the vine. Maybe you are one who has never borne fruit. You've never changed. And you're, in your current course, you never will. But you'll be swept up and cast into the fire. Abide in the vine. Abide in the vine. Believe upon the Son. Rest in his love and be saved. So, brothers and sisters, as we uh, depend upon the true vine, relentlessly relying upon him in prayer and asking him to bear fruit in our life. Let us love one another. Let us love one another. Division, disunity, arguments, apathy, lack of care, what these things should not be named among us. But let us be people who abide in Christ and prove that. Not just in word or thought, but in deed. Maybe in this coming week, think of some inventive ways perhaps to to love members of your household or, 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 or workplace perhaps. Jesus is not a failed vine, but he is the true vine that bears much fruit and so glorifies his father. It's my prayer for you that God's word may abide in you today from what you have heard. And that it would bear fruit to God's glory. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Abide with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.